hugely uh, d difficult area, I suppose, you know, when you're coming into coming into this area of psychology to be the, I like the idea of being flexible. I think that is a really, a really good point, you know, so, um, uh, so hopefully, I mean, it segues nicely into a little bit as to what I'm, I'm talking about today. So I'm, I'm, I'm here um, as uh, the representative, I suppose, of the division of neuropsychology um, to talk to you about uh, neuropsychology. So um, hopefully over the course of um, the next uh, 20 minutes or so, I'll give you an idea about, you know, kind of what what we do and, you know, kind of what a, a career in neuropsychology might look like. Um, now, you know, I have to say from the outset a little bit that, um, uh, you know, um, I'm, not that I'm a fraud, but I currently occupy the post of um, a senior clinical psychologist in St. James's Hospital, um, and I, I'm currently chair of the Division of Neuropsychology, and the reason that I'm kind of putting out there a little bit of slight proviso here is that uh, I'd, my daily job, I suppose, to some extent isn't through, um, it doesn't, uh, don't do neuropsychology um all day if you know what i mean um, but i have a strong background in neuropsychology um, and i've been able to use those neuropsychology skills in the job that i do um, the, last year this this talk was given by dr marsha ward um, who is a senior clinical neuropsychology down down in cork and she's un, unavailable to do it this year even though she would did a cracking job last year so i'm kind of stepping into her shoes here um, and and using a lot of the information that she would have given last year. So apologies if to some of this, it feels a little bit familiar, um, but I think it was such a good presentation. I think that it would be a shame to, you know, kind of um, to uh, mess with it too much. So um, so what, what, is, what about neuropsychology? Well, look, why is neuropsychology important? And I think you're probably looking around and you'll see there are a lot of different presentations over the course of the day in different areas of neuropsychology. Uh, different areas of psychology and I'm just going to focus obviously on this particular area and just a few facts to be bearing in mind a little bit you know when we're kind of looking at what a career here it is estimated that there are 800,000 people living in Ireland with a neurological condition okay now that's a sub quite a substantial amount of people um, probably a little bit of a quiet population in some respects and by that neurological conditions we can be talking about anything from dementia through to epilepsy through to acquired brain injuries strokes you know so 800,000 people that bordering on a, a fifth a, a, a fifth of the population and it, it's noticeable there that 40,000 people diagnosed in Ireland a year so it's a substantial you know kind of area um, that, that we're dealing about here and um, just if we look at other just specific facts, you know, we could go on forever about specific about these areas, but brain injury is leading cause of death and debility and disability in children and adolescents. Um, we can talk about alcohol related brain injury, Wernicke's and Kapilofi, Korsakoff's, um, you know, is a different a specific type of brain injury. Um, one in two homeless people have a brain injury. And that's a quite stunning piece of inf fact there. You know, the, the, the amount of people out there on the street there, a lot of them have, 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 have had some level of, of injury. One in four prisoners in, in our prison services have brain injury. So you can see here that just looking at this, this it's, it's a, 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 an area which is emerging more and we're becoming more aware of the, of the, of the these these statistics, and um, stroke is going to be increased by up to fifty nine percent by twenty thirty five. Okay, that's another area around stroke, and you know it's interesting to also note that as our population ages, that the incidence of things like dementia will obviously uh, will obviously uh, you know kind of uh, increase in keeping with that. You know so. You know, we can see this area is becoming in increasingly more important as the years go by. You know. So the brain is the most important organ that you have, <laughs> according to the brain. <laughs> so the idea here, I suppose, is that, you know, obviously it's a hugely important area in, in our functioning in terms of, but when we, we need to mind it and look after it, and I suppose that neuropsychology is very much geared into trying to uh, look at the brain in terms of being a, a, a muscle, a function, and to try and work out ways how to look after it, number one, but also to try and work around any particular difficulties that might come up for people. So neuropsychology, 
I I love this I love this slide. <laughs> it it really represents a little bit about the different uh, different ways of looking at it. So <laughs> so we over here we have uh, kind of what what my parents think I do. <laughs> so there's, you've got a doctor there looking at scans and brain scans and trying to assess. They'll all be very proud and you know kind of looking at the medical aspect. What my friends think I do. Like kind of lounging around here, you know, kind of not doing reading the newspaper. What patients think I'm going to do to them. Uh, for those of you who might recognize, this is an excerpt from the film A Clockwork Orange, but it looks pretty traumatic. So we have to bear in mind that when we're going in and talk about neuropsychological assessment to, to clients and patients that they're going, oh my God, what's, what's this about? It can be quite scary. What I want to do, well, there's the romanticized notion of house here from the television series, to those of you that familiarize it, what I'm supposed to be doing. Uh, oh, where's, where's that gone? Oh. Sorry about this, there we go. What I'm supposed to be doing, um, and uh, this is a, a, a lady here, obviously doing some neuropsychological assessment there, and what I really do, <laughs> a lot of paperwork. That's not that's not strictly true. I we put that there in a lot of jest, but there is a lot of uh, writing up and reports and paperwork that goes with a neuropsychological assessment as well. But I just thought that it's, it's definitely an interesting way of looking at uh, looking at the various roles. And I would imagine a lot of my colleagues in different areas of psychology would say something similar. Um, so what what is neuropsychology about? Well, look. At the end of the day, we've got the lovely, we've got a lovely uh, map of the brain here, just looking at, and we looks at various. We when we're assessing neuropsychologically, these are some of the areas that we might be looking at. So you've got things like speaking, speech and language, orientation to time and space of the people that we're assessing. Are they orientated? Are they putting an effort to the assessment? It's a really important part of it. What is their premorbid ability? Do you know what I mean? What kind of level are they operating from in the background? Attention, memory. We're looking at sensory and perceptual motor functions, executive functions, speed, personality, emotions. There's a wide range of areas of functioning of the brain that we tend to look at through neuropsychological assessment of the brain here, splits it up into various temp the frontal lobe, temporal lobe, uh, parietal lobe and occipital lobe, and then the, the the subcortical, you know, areas of the brain. So in looking at the behaviors, we get a sense, a better sense of what's happening in the brain about areas that might be potentially damaged. So we, while we can't say for certain that an area of the brain is damaged here, though this is going to happen, uh, we can make in, in, insinuations about using the neuropsychological assessments that we do about, about what's going on in the brain and what might have been affected and therefore looking to make recommendations off the back of that assessment, okay? So these are some of the areas, the neuropsychological functions that we tend to look at. And as we can see here, um, you know, when we look at certain areas of the brain, it's, it's, a, it's a messy, it's a little bit of a messy diagram, but it gives us a sense of some of the, the areas to look for, the areas we're looking at, wrecking. so if, over here, um, the frontal lobes of the brain, looking at recognition of emotions, theory of mind, insight, self-evaluation. And these are broad brushstrokes in terms of neuropsychological functioning, but it gives us an idea of some of the areas of the brain and, and what we're looking at. So sustained attention, divided attention, free recall, delayed memory with the temporal lobe, and back here in the occipital lobe, looking at visual perception, visual construction, and looking at the coming up into the parietal lobe here, object naming, uh, word finding fluency and flexibility. As you can see there, so it's just to give you a little bit of an idea about some of the things that we're really looking at. And the assessment themselves, you know, it looks at, you know, various types of assessment we might be looking at here, including some of the block design tests, for instance. Some of you might have seen these before where we're asking people to put blocks together into certain shapes. And that gives us an idea of somebody's, of somebody's visual, visual, visual construction functioning or perceptual functioning. Um, and there's various tests that we use, like the Wechsler Memory Scale, and there's the TEA, the Test of Everyday Attention, which we'll look at this particular area here, um, sustained attention, divided attention, um, the DCAVs, which very much looks at uh, frontal lobe functioning, so all of these kind of areas, flexibility of problem solving, meta cognition, so the DCAVs would look into that area, and then, and so on. So, you know, there's the waste of the Wechsler Adult Intelligence Scale, which looks uh, um, which uh, gives us a sense of intellectual ability, 
And, you know, the Tower of London test is part of the DCAVs here, which is problem solving, you know. So it's just to give you an idea of some of the assessments that we do to look at and connect functions to the brain. So there's a nice little slide there, a nice little meme, as we say, um, not up to date with official terminology, but to neuropsychology assessment and beyond. And, you know, so we basically what we'd be looking at is when we're doing this and when we're looking at the assessment process, we're using our core skills. Our core skills would be as clinical psychology. Um, and we're using our core skills that and building on that. So we're going to explicit, specifically apply those core skills, psychology skills to a population who have developmental or acquired neurological problems. OK, now, look, these neurological problems can either be static, i.e. they're there and they're unchanging off the back of maybe a, a, a uh, for the back of a like a brain injury that's happened or it can be degenerative when we talk about more um, dementias we talk about you know kind of a degenerative disorders and um, and you know that might be getting worse so you can be dealing with so I moved on you can be dealing with something that's static or something is degenerative uh, it can be a sudden onset or a gradual one so you'll be looking to assess that and requires advanced advanced understanding and lifelong learning on the brain its systems but if we look over here into this this diagram here it just gives you a sense of we would do a diagnostic assessment we look at assessment of current functioning so how they are we can do pre-surgical assessments as well for people that are going in for a surgery in the, on the brain we do an assessment at the start and look at maybe doing assessment afterwards just to see if there's been any change post-surgery we look at outcome assessments. How has any particular surgeries or any particular medications or any treatments affect things? Prognostication. We can, sometimes they're able to do assessments, give an idea about how the process is going to go, how things are going to progress as it goes on. We want to be able to inform things like cognitive rehab. Do you know what I mean? So in terms of actually being able to say um, what do they need to, what can they work on to try and make brain functioning a bit better? So if they have attention deficits or attention problems, what can they do that's gonna help them try and rehab that attentional process? So we need to be able to guide people. Promotion of coping. So the idea here of saying, well, they have this difficulty, but is there any way that we can work with other functions or other processes or other uh, neuropsychological functions to actually help them to get better and to help them to cope with the situation? Management of challenging behaviours. It can often be the case that after a brain change or a brain damage or whatever, that the behaviours might be a little bit more challenging. And how can we help person bring an education to that and help carers and people to cope with that better? staff training and supervision to be giving an idea to people who work with people of neurological conditions about how to manage them how to work with them care of family interventions obviously psychoeducation a way of informing families and carers about some of the the difficulties that they may be experiencing and how to cope with them and then we'd also do the old research and audit side of things as well where we have to look at what we do and assess as to whether it's functioning as all good psychologists are trained to do anyway you know so where might they they be practicing? Well, you know, we obviously have their neuropsychologists in acute hospitals, um, you know, kind of assessing people with clients that are going into uh, into uh, for operations or for people that have been coming into hospitals, looking at cognitive impairment. Um, we have neuropsychologists in post-acute tertiary centers. So the idea there is that, you know, after operations and after, you know, kind of to when, the, when their situation might be a stable, but they're not ready to go home, they might go to a post-acute ter tertiary centers. The Martyr Hospital, for instance, has very developed post-acute tertiary centers. Specialist community services. So to specialist areas that look into specific difficulties like epilepsy or look into specific difficulties with Parkinson's disease. So specialist... So community services which is focused in on a specialist area. Um, HSC services such as older adult services, that's currently what my, my placement is. I'm based in I'm, I'm based in HSC and I work in an older adult service working with older people. So there's a lot of psychological, um, you know, dealing with med depression, but there's also assessments that I would do in terms of, of, of cognitive impairment. And then community neuro rehab teams. So we've got, you know, kind of a lot of, uh, for instance, ABI Ireland and Headway, uh, two of the biggest, two of the bigger areas that are looking at brain injury. Um, and, uh, you know, so the neuropsychologists are very well embedded in terms of rehab teams as well. So those to give you a, a broad brush of, of ideas. And this is the concept of loving the brain. 
What does a neuropsychologist do? Well, we do neuropsychological assessments. I showed you a couple of those earlier on. But we also do one-to-one -one and group therapy as well, working with people who have had a neurological condition. One-to-one -one group uh, and group cognitive rehabilitation also in terms of actually working with people that have neurological conditions and trying to help them to, uh, to uh, work more with those. Um, and uh, to uh, also working with family services, we do supervision, supervision and service development, discipline development and community resource, lecturing and speaking at conferences such as doing, and research. So um, it's a wide, much like most people in psychology, I suppose, in, in, in clinical or counselling uh, psychology and, and all the other areas of psychology, I think that the broad brushstrokes are roughly the same. I suppose that what might mark out um, would be that the basis that we would do, the basis of what we work off is a good neuropsychological assessment. Um, along with a clinical interview, along with, you know, kind of um, interviewing and seeing and getting background information, it's not just based on the tests. We also like to be work, we also, we have to do a good clinical interview with our clients as well to get a good sense of their background and how they've progressed even before any neurological changes. You know? So, um, you know, the, the assessments are, aren't, the whole shebang, even though we talk about neuropsych assessments, it's not the whole deal in terms of a good assessment. And um, we would, that's the reason why I suppose that neuropsychology is also based, that we have a good psychology counseling or neuropsych uh, clinical training in the background as well. Um, I'm going to hopefully move on there. It gives me <laughs> frozen, typical frozen on the screen. Ah, there we go. Okay. So where I'm basically also just wanted to say a little bit about the division of neuropsychology as well, you know, because this is a good way to actually get to know the, the area. And we have something called Grand Rounds, which happens every six weeks at the moment. And it's, it's, uh, it's uh, um, advertised on Twitter a lot. So I would advise people who have been interested in neuropsychology and they want to get a sense of some of the cases that come up within neuropsychology to see how it works. Attending one of these grand rounds might be a really, really useful thing to do. And this is just to give you an idea about what it might look like, a timetable. Um, so we have presentations which look at specific cases from our practicing neuropsychologists will bring a case for discussion. Um, so if you want to get further details of that, at Don PSI is the Twitter handle. And if you're following the, the, the Division of Neuropsychology Twitter um, uh, page, then you will get an update of when those uh, when the grand rounds are happening. We've also done a scoping survey of neuropsychological training and supervision needs of psychologists in Ireland, um, uh, ably uh, you know kind of put out there by Phoenix and her colleagues there, um, and it was to look at what neuropsychology needs because I suppose there are a lot of people who are working in areas of with neurological functioning with maybe not any particular neuropsychological training. So if we look here, we can see that. The estimates of proportion of client respondents on the left work with who have neurological and neurodevelopmental conditions. And so we got to say how many people they work with have neurological conditions. As you can see here, you know, um, there's, a, you know, for a variety of people, number of respondents who said so from one to 10 percent of um uh, you know, kind of, of, of the, on the left here, we've got the number of psychologists who said that they worked with people with neurological Logical conditions. See here, you know that uh, there are a lot of reports of people here on 76 to 100 percent here of clients are working with. So there's a lot of our colleagues out there in the communities, out there psychologists who are working with clients with neurological conditions and maybe not neuropsychological ne um, need neuropsychological support. Do you feel have access to adequate training and teaching to support your work with clients in neurological and neuro neurodevelopmental conditions? And as you can see here, the broad brushstrokes of people who work. In psychology have said no. So we need more neuropsychologists to try and help to support our, our colleagues who are working. So it's another aspect of what we do is providing supervision to our colleagues working out there in the fields who maybe aren't neuro neuropsychology trained but would, would really benefit from having some input and some help in working with these clients. And these are various areas as to where neuropsychology is becoming increasingly important. So it's a, a, a increasingly burgeoning, burgeoning area. 
in sports, in uh, therapy. This is uh, com uh, compassion focused therapy, dura psychology of criminal behavior. As I said earlier on, one in four prisoners have a brain injury. I mean, that, that's, fa that's something that we're, maybe we didn't know in terms of these people. How did they end up in prison? Did they end up in prison due to, um, you know, kind of, uh, uh, you know, kind of a behavior which might have been uh, 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 from born of a, a brain injury? They have to ask these questions. So it's, you know, really um, wide ranging area of function. And this again, just to endorse the, the 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 neuropsychology division, don't we always take full membership as well, which are people who have a neuropsychological qualification. But we also take associate membership as well, um, with people that um, uh, you know to come in and join us as associate members. Okay, so my time is my time has reached a conclusion, and um, so um, I'm I'm happy to take any queries and questions there. Um, I I think that um, I'm not sure whether ah oh, there's Ruth. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yeah. Guide me a little bit there in terms of can I take any time for any questions or uh, if we you could do it in the chat that would be great. Thanks, Nick. Yeah, no problem. I will do that now. Okay, so thanks, thanks very much.